about expectations. This is the expectation partial and I, I have it <coughs> when we started together putting the curriculum in the class. Is essentially in order for you to do this, right, which is a field in the 90s specifically in QA, it's a very important for a QA person to know the whole big picture. Because right? when you are testing something, you need to know a lot of things. Um, so, we want to make sure you understand how the software is built. We're looking at making sure you understand if somebody says software quality assurance, what does it mean, right? A lot of uh, people uh, relate software quality assurances as testing, right? You will learn it. It's much more than just testing. Testing is one small piece of overall software quality assurance. We'll talk about various testing terminology. Also understand it. In order for the quality assurance, there are certain testing artifacts that you need to create. What are those? What other artifacts that you need to know it? Okay. We'll utilize some test tools. Um, we'll actually expose you to a lot of open source also in addition to the HP tools. And uh, we want to make sure that you get an exposure to the real life projects. Okay. We both have been in the IT world for a long, we've been teaching it, and our goal compared to a lot of um, uh, school-related courses that they give you, it's a lot more theoretical knowledge. Uh, and uh, while it's great, when you go into the real life on the first day, it's not that helpful. Right? So we want to make sure that you get an understanding of the real life projects. And uh, by the time you will be done with the working it, you will be having an equivalent experience with somebody who is in already in working in the QA field a couple of years, at least. Okay, so that's the um, goal we have. It. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, uh, logistics. So uh, we'll typically go at from nine to one uh, all days. Um, and there are a couple, one day actually, where we'll ask you to go a little bit longer, uh, where we're trying to do it in some automation uh, uh, related topics. Well, typically, uh, what you're going to see it is the first two, three sessions going to be a little bit heavy on theory because we need to set it up to make sure that you understand how everything fits together overall. And then from then onwards, we're going to spend a lot of time just doing the real project. Okay, so we're going to utilize projects as a mean to do the learning with hands-on experiences. Okay, we'll probably like it's um, go hour, hour and a half, pretty much every day, and then take a break. Uh, if you want, like it's there is um, coffee, donuts, snacks, water, right? So um, stay away. That's why there's coffee. Um, if you're not already aware, there's a restroom here, and we'll try to break 10, 15 minutes every hour and a half uh, for you to just uh, stretch out your legs. Okay. Um, what you have it in front of you, if I can borrow it, is a folder. Okay. So uh, everything that you're going to see here that we're going to present in the slide, it, it's in there. So feel free to make a note. This is your copy. Um, I don't want people to make previously notes because all of them it's already there. Then uh, you will have certain tab sections. The one after that is uh, talks about all the exercises that we'll go through it uh, during the course. Then there are certain documents uh, which are the project artifacts and then we'll just go through those documents as uh, in fact like we'll start with one of the documents today and then we'll just go through it throughout the course. Okay. As we expected, um, there are tons of technologies and tools that is used in today's world when you do it software development. And uh, by the time we will be done with it, we'll be going through all of it. Okay. 
Any questions in general structure or anything before we dive uh, into it? Can you talk about the Thursday evening lab? Yes. Um, <clears throat> yes, it's a good point. So um, the way we have structured this courses is that Saturdays and Sundays we'll talk about the new material as well as we'll talk about uh, various uh, project activities and all. And Thursdays from uh, 6.30 to 8.30, both Harsha and I will be here. And the purpose of that is uh, for you to get an additional hands-on time, as well as any questions that you may have it, that uh, we go over on uh, Saturday, Sunday, right? then we'll be assigning homework. Yes, so there will be homework, right? so it won't be just only in class. Uh, and so we'll utilize the times on Thursday to talk about those homework, we talk about those in details, get your doubts as well as uh, share. It. So it's going to be a more hands-on lab type of things on Thursday. While we would not introduce any new topics, uh, what we have seen it in the past with a lot of students is um, they rely heavily on Thursday sessions to do the interactions and do the project work and all. Uh, we are recording it all the sessions also, so in case if you miss it or if you want to like it's uh, at home, you're trying to like it's go through material and say, hey, I want to like it's understand what was talked about. You will have access to those videos. You can rewind it and you can listen to it. Okay. Now this video, is we try to keep it um, a more closed because of the privacy and uh, other issues. So um, you probably need to give your Gmail account, email address, and I don't know, Marshall, if you have everybody. No, we'll collect that sometime today. Okay. So just give your uh, Gmail account. If you don't have it, just create one because these are uploaded on the uh, private sites for the YouTube. So you will need a Gmail account to access to those things. Okay. Okay. Let's get started. Um, so first we will talk about what the software is. So all of you, like it's a, as I was hearing your introduction, right, um, said you wanted to be an curator, but at the same time I also heard on the line a uh, message that, yeah, we've been working on it, everything that we do it has some sort of computer or software related to it. Right? Um, so uh, essentially when you look at it at the basic of what a computer software is, it's nothing but a machine readable instructions which tells a certain piece of um, computing device what to do. Right? So it gives a specific operations. So, um, and, and why do we learn for software, right? So uh, if you go turn around today, everything that you do it has some sort of software associated with it. So for example, if you go out to the grocery, right, a store to buy something, well, there are software systems associated with it, right? There's an inventory happening. There's the logistics of how those things get shifted to the store or to you. When you go at the counter to purchase it, there's a software associated with it, right? because it's called a point of sale system. Um, you, you try to do it like it's just Uncle Sam collected money from all of us, right? 15 days ago. Uh, so everybody, when you try to do it, income tax preparation, that's the software. Right? Simple thing is that I'm kind of teaching this course right, and using a PowerPoint, that's the software. I'm just presenting it, the material that I'm trying to do it. Um, you do Google, right? you're trying to find anything, maps, when you're driving it, all those things are software. Right? So software it is essentially so much integrated uh, today in our world that it's almost kind of, without that, your productivity will start seeing significant impact. Okay. So the whole goal of building a software is to aid in productivity, whether that's an individual productivity or industrial productivity or a financial productivity, you need to do all those things. Okay. Uh, it is simple, right? You can just say it is software, it's nothing but a black box where I give some inputs, right? In a, based on the functions 
that is put it inside that black box, you get an output. Okay. So I, I heard it some some of you specifically Chip has some experience working with the hardware and all. Right? So think about it first a computer, right? So when you look at the computer, you can almost think about it it's in the three layers. Okay. One layer is the hardware. which is typically controlled through what is known as a firmware. Okay. And I'll walk through a specific example in a moment with all of you. Okay. On top of the hardware, there's always something known as an operating system. Okay. And the third layer is known as an application software. Everybody has a smartphone? Right? Think of this as a computer. It is, in fact, a computer. Uh, the processing power on this phone today is more than the Apollo mission that was going to be. Okay. So, okay. let's take an example of uh, iPhone. Right. When you look at it, it's a hardware, it's actually the physical thing that you touch and feel. Underneath it, if you look into it, it has battery, it has chips, it has the uh, processing units, both graphical and uh, floating point units, right? one which does a calculation, one which gives you a nice uh, image and processing pictures when you take it. Okay? And it also has some chips to store memory and some chips to store uh, the boot up startup instructions. So that's your hardware. Okay. Uh, in, in order to operate a battery, right, you get certain level, right? So as your battery is getting consumed, you get a percentage how much battery is left. Right? Uh, when you try to make a phone call, right, there are certain chipsets get instruction. Right? But you don't go and directly interact with the battery, right? You interact with the software which is written on top of it. Okay. So the way those particular hardware pieces are controlled is through a, a nano program or nano firmware, right? So that's the firmware instructions. So these are specific, very highly optimized, specific to the hardware written instructions. That just controls the input and output of those particular hardware chips. Okay. On top of it, you have an iOS. Apple keeps sending pushing it up for the iOS. That iOS is the essentially operating system. It knows how to operate the underlying hardware properly. Right. It also interacts with this firmware, right? Gets a response back from a firmware in terms of signal, and then interprets it and gets you what exactly is that, right? So at the hardware level, all the input and output. It's interacted through the firmware with the operating systems. Then on top of that, then you have an application software. It's, for example, if you have an email application or a Facebook application, right? that's an application specific. It has nothing to do with the operating system. It is giving you specific instructions or specific productivity level tasks. Camera. Right, so you have a camera icon, and there is a camera app on the iPhone. Those are the application software. Okay, this piece of software typically don't interact directly with the hardware. It interacts with the operating system. Okay. So if you look at it, right, the mail application will work fine on the uh, iOS device. At the same time, it will work fine on Google device. Or Microsoft device. Right? That's a presentation. Like, so, 
application software is the one which is typically does a productivity. Operating system software typically controls the underlying hardware. Okay, so when somebody talks about a computer system, okay, they're talking about this entire thing. You can't have a hardware alone expected to get any productivity. You can't have application software standalone, right? It needs to run underneath on some platform, right? A lot of times you will hear, hear where, what is the computing platform, right? So the operating system and hardware essentially forms a computing platform. And the application software is the productivity on that. So, most of the work when we talk about software and systems, right, is related to the application software. I would say it's probably around, I would say it's, I'll probably go a little bit higher, 97 to 98 percent of software developers and the quality insurance people typically are working only in the application software domain. Because how many iOS systems you have, right, versus how many applications that is available on the uh, iTunes store or on the Google Play, right? That gives you a check, right? Because there are very few hardware and operating system manufacturer. They still need to do the testing. Don't get me wrong. The OS needs to be as thoroughly tested, in fact, it needs to be tested more thoroughly than the application software. Now, there are some systems you're gonna find it which is gonna be dedicated systems which is not going to be a more common day computing system. Right? So for example, uh, in a car man manufacturing plant, right, there are robots which essentially does that manufacturing. Those are specific systems. It has a specific software. Right? That's called its dedicated system. When you go up into um, a space system, right? so like it's a rocket launch and all, there are dedicated systems. Right? There's a closed loop feedback that so those cases are additional things, right? Which is embedded system, you'll see it in some sense. Since the application software and operating system tends to get a little bit more closer and fused together. But for most of the part that all of you will be working it, you're gonna see this three listing today. Okay. Any questions in terms of what is the uh, software? Now one of the things I forgot to mention to you is um, if you have any questions, Ask there, right? Because chances that somebody else also has in the class the same question. <coughs> Remember, you're here to learn. Uh, so there's no questions, which is, hey, maybe it's a simple or silly question. There's no silly question. Uh, but more important thing is, uh, we want it to be an interactive session. If you have questions, ask there, so we can talk about it. Uh, if it's something that's coming in the next couple of um, uh, minutes talk, or it's going to be something we'll talk in a little bit detail later, I'll tell you, right? But let's keep it interactive. So we talked about uh, that, right? A lot of times, operating system is also known as a system software. Right? The purpose of it is, it's essentially interact with the hardware of the system. And then there is an optical, I'm sorry, application software. Okay? And typically you can figure out the difference is the operating systems, it's a lot of times it's closely related to the computer platform which it runs, versus application software is something that you can download it from the internet or install it uh, from downloading the software and so on. Okay, it typically uh, resides in what is known as a storage device rather than a uh, built-in memory of the uh, operating system. <coughs> we talked about all of that. Well, let's talk about, yes, sir. Sometimes you find, uh, find that some application software are run by a specific operating system. So uh, can a software developer change the operating system from uh, 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 like uh, Windows to uh, uh, Linux? So uh, when you can look at this layer, right? Think about 
this is all language communication. Okay. So uh, let's say um, I'm talking in English. Right? Somebody else is talking in French. A third person talks in German. Okay. Uh, can we communicate? Yes. But in order to communicate, we all need to come to the same language, right? There could be a sign language at that point, right? So, the same way operating systems are specific for a hardware, right? And when they expose an API, which is known as application programmable interface, right? So essentially, they, when they expose the interface to the outside world, what is an application software world to communicate with it, it's run in specific things. Okay. So that's the case when you like do something in a Windows. Right? The Windows exposes the interface a little bit different than uh, when you do it into the Apple or Mac OS, or when you do it on Linux platforms. Okay. So most of the times, your application software has to adapt to that interface. So you, when you see it, uh, a lot of times application software is then kind of broken down into two different layers itself. Okay, one which is doing an application-specific functionality, which is going to be same with respect to what platform it runs on. Okay, and then there is certain sets of libraries if you can think of them. Okay, or certain set of plugin components that are specifically to interact with the operating. So when you say, it is, hey, I have an application software running on a Windows platform, can I take it and put it on a Mac OS? X? Answer is, depends. If the application is built in such a way that this thing is common, and there is only a small layer, and when you swap that layer, you can run the same software on that. As long as this particular red part that I've drawn it, is built for that operating system. So like Microsoft Office, you can't right. run it on Windows versus Mac. Yeah. So think about it, right? Like it's, um, I talked about tech software, right? So if you go buy an off-the-shelf tech software, TurboTax, right? It'll have an operating system requirement written on it. It says that, hey, it'll work on this version of Windows, it'll work on this version of Mac OS, right? None of them supports Linux, right? But could open potentially support Linux also. So what what it tells at that right that you build the software such a way that at the time of installation it will require and figure it out what is underlying operating system, and then it will take associated library written for that and plug it and then make it installed. Right? So those cases, yes. Uh, another example you will see a lot of times when a new company launches a mobile app, right? They will just first say, hey, it's only available on iOS. Okay. After a while, it'll be available on Windows platform or a Google platform, right? What is at that point? They've done with building this. They've built this particular component for iOS, right? So at that point, if we release the pack, if this is a single package for that particular operating system, then they will build a second one integrate it, and then do it. And that's where it's most important of the quality assurance comes in, right? Because you need to make sure that the piece written here can perform independently of the operating system. But in order to test it, you still need some operating system to run it, right? So that's where you plug it and into it. Then whenever you make some changes to here, you need to make sure it's gonna work across all platforms, right? If you make change here, then all you have to worry about is this one platform. But if you make change here, then everything. If you are writing an operating systems and you make a change here, guess what? You need to make sure it works with everything that is written on top. <coughs> and the typical way to do it is making sure that this interface layer has been tested thoroughly whenever you make changes here. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. So um, within this software, application software world, right? You're going to see it three different classifications. Okay. 
uh, often uh, when you talk about it, right, people will say, hey, is this a custom software or something that I can buy? Right. Uh, so that is kind of a similar concept when you talk about the type of the application software. Right? The first one is proprietary software. Okay. This is essentially the application software that you wrote it for a specific purpose and it's built by a specific company. Okay. Take an example. All of you has taken airplanes, right? All of you has flown. Okay. The airplane. There are like three or four major uh, companies which makes airplanes, right? But when you go at, to control an airplane, okay, all of them it's written in the software. Right? So they kind of use it to fly by wire. Right, essentially given instructions and all the wires are controlled through that. That's a perfect example of a proprietary software, right? If you're flying in a Boeing airplane, the software written in to manage and control that plane is specifically for that. It's owned by Boeing, right? And it's used only for the specific operating system. Take another example, iOS, right? Can you run iOS on any other Android phones? You can't, right? Can you own or mo make a modification to iOS? You can't. It's owned by Apple. You can do anything you want here. You cannot touch this part of it. There's a proprietary and a type of property rights associated with it. That's another example of the proprietary software. Okay. Second example is off the shelf. That's a off-the-shelf software. It's a software written, still written by probably a one company or a consortium, right? There's still intellectual property rights associated with it. You still can do whatever you want with that software. But it's written in such a way that it is not targeted only for one platform, but it can run on a whole bunch of platforms, and you can just download it, install it, configure it, and use it. Okay. So um, some of the examples for this off-the-shelf software is uh, obviously we talked about the tech software, right? We like trying to use. Another example Herschel talked about is Microsoft Office. <clears throat> Even though it is owned by Microsoft, I can go ahead and install it into my Windows machine or a Mac machine, right? Or if I'm like trying to use it, my uh, Google Chromebooks, there are versions available for that too. Okay. Uh, it is kind of migrating its lot more towards what's known as a cloud software. So essentially you have only certain component and then access it everything going in. So that's kind of off the shelf software. One of the big things you can see it in a commercial space is uh, the tools, uh, like uh, one of the tools that we're going to use it is HP LM. Right? Uh, it's tools built by HP. It will run it. Right? It's a packet software that HP sells it to all the different companies that you can download it or you can purchase it, configure it for your own personal <coughs> or corporate use. Okay. Um, Microsoft Outlook for Google Mail. That's another example of this. The next category is an open source software. Okay. Now this set of application software is uh, owned by a community. Okay. So, um, Whenever things is owned by a community of developers, right? It's available for free to use under a specific user agreement. Okay. So, uh, for example, um, we talked about iOS. It's owned by Apple. The competing product is Google's Android. Okay. While that it's not completely open source, right? Google makes it available over on it on multiple platforms. Right? You give the ro royalty. Uh, under a specific agreement, right? But if you want, you can download it and customize to whatever version of the uh, phone that you're using. It's free to use it. You can uh, make whatever changes you want to make it to the Android operating system. As long as you do it within a certain agreement, you can make modification, you can use it. Another example for that is uh, I don't know how many of you heard word Java. Right? There's a software development tools called Java. 
it's an open source. Originally it was built by Sun, but then it, they kind of exposed it to all of the community. So as a community, you can go ahead and make changes to that. The, the, okay. um, how many are aware of Facebook or users of Facebook? Okay. Right? So when you know it, like it's when they talk about Facebook also talks about 300, 400 active users at any given point with over a billion users. Right? So think about it, in order to run all of that, they need a massive infrastructure, like right? all the servers and all. So when you talk about that data center level, you need to now manage it, right? Because I as a delivery tell log in from this phone today. Tomorrow I might travel and log in from California. The day after that I might be logging you from a completely different country. I still need to access all that data. That means all of the data needs to be managed. All of the server and the data center needs to be managed, right? There are specific softwares around it. Google, I'm sorry, Facebook made that entire software as an open source. So if you are really interested, you can take it, the massive data center management software, it's an open source available for you. You can go and change it whatever way you want. Okay. So those are some of the examples of open software, whether it's from common use all the way to specific use and still available as an open source. Okay. Any questions on the three main types of it? A lot of times you will see this proprietary software as a custom software, or in some case, times you will say, hey, I bought the off off the shelf software and customized for my use. Okay. So when people talk about custom software, they could be talking one or the other. <coughs> Let's now talk about the software architecture. Okay. So till now we talked about what the software is. Uh, now let's talk about when you start building a software, what are the things that you need to work? understand it. Now I'll give a analogous example as we go through this thing. Okay. Is, uh, think about it, right? Like it's you live in a house. So you know everything about house, right? So how many rooms, specifications, right? How many rooms it has, that, right? How many windows it's, how many doors? Uh, what kind of uh, electrical systems, sanitation systems that you need, right? So you know the software?